do a little bit of logistics before we get into the, um, the overview of ROMs, and then we're going to have some hands-on ROMs activities. So the way that I'm, I'm um, formatting this clinic, we have about a three-hour time frame, but in the middle of that three hours, there's a half an hour or 15-minute break to get some coffee, which I'm sure you'll need after listening to me <laughs> for um, an hour and a half. Um, and then when we come back from the coffee break, I'd like to have a discussion to get some feedback on how you think this um, hands-on exercise and the, and the idealized model that I'm showing you is, is going. And, and part of the motivation for doing this clinic was that there's been a call in the marine working group and the coastal working group to have some idealized um, hydrodynamic models within systems. So one motivation for setting um, up this idealized model that I'm going to show today is that we might be able to provide this tool within the um, systems as an as a idealized shelf hydrodynamic model that could be used for um, whatever application people wanted. So once, we, once you get a chance to, to try it out and analyze some data and try running the model again, then I want to kind of brainstorm on where we should go forward with this type of effort. Is this the kind of thing that the working groups need? Or are there other approaches that would be better? Or are there improvements we could do to this model? OK, so, then the, so the timing will be I'm going to give an introduction to ROMs and to the test case that we're running for this clinic. And then we'll have time for you guys to um, kind of roll your sleeves up and analyze some of the model output data. We have, um, have done some groundwork so that at least a few of you should be able to run, to make some changes to the model and rerun it. We can't all redo it. That would bog down the system. And um, so I think when we get to that point, we'll kind of make a vote of how many people um, have access to Beach that could conceivably rerun the model and then maybe pare it down to just, just um, maybe one to three model runs that we, we start up as, a, as kind of a group effort. And then after coffee break and after our discussion, there will be time to analyze those model runs. I think it takes about 12 minutes to run the model um, okay, for the, 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 for the time period that we've set up. So like I said, the motivation, oh, and so before I start, the way we've um, set up, the way we in our group analyze NetCDF ROMs output is to use MATLAB. So we have um, on our thumb drives, on our thumb drives, we have a few MATLAB scripts that you can use to analyze some of the ROMs output. So that, so the hands-on part of the clinic will be um, analyzing NetCDF output. So I'd like to see a show of hands of people who cannot analyze um, who don't have MATLAB. And then maybe those, those of you who do not have MATLAB could partner up with someone who does. OK? All right, so maybe ra ra raise your hand if you have MATLAB and you're willing to work with one of these other people that don't. <laughs> OK? OK? And I, actually, this, this clinic is based on a class that I teach. And in the class, I always pair the students up. For one thing, we, we have about six computers in the, in the lab, so we need to kind of combine forces because of the number of computers we have. But it, I find it works a lot better when people work together anyway. So, so once we get to the hands-on part, then those of you who don't have MATLAB, if you want to browse the model output, um, choose a buddy who does, and you can work together with them. Okay. So like I ca I'm calling this clinic. Um, ROMs for the non-specialist, and I kind of gave one of, one of the buzzwords that came out of our, our um, all-hands meeting last year was a call for something that we called ROMs Light. So ROMs is a regional ocean modeling system, and it's a pretty comprehensive community coastal ocean model. But within the systems community, there's a call for something that's not quite as complicated, not quite as um, many options to choose from, a kind of pared down to um, more of the bare bones of what we need, ROMS model, and we called that ROMS light. So to prepare for the clinic, I tried to set up something that could be a ROMS light that, um, that people could hopefully use with less of a learning curve than, running the, than implementing the full ROMS model. So this is a, an example movie from um, one of our group's recent efforts in running a full ROMS model. So I guess I should have introduced before I started um, Julia, 
Moriarty is a graduate student at VIMS, and Tara Niskern is a research scientist at VIMS. I want to thank them for helping me put this clinic together. And um, they've done a lot of work here this week and in ground, ground work to get us to this point to have this clinic. So I appreciate y'all's help. And, um, and, but to start the clinic, I wanted to show you an example of kind of the full, the ROMS heavy, maybe we would call it. Um, so this is a, what Jul Julia's model run that um, she produced for her master's thesis. And she recently published it as an Estrin and Coastal Modeling Conference paper. So there's a citation for 2014. So in this model run, Julia um, developed a model grid for this site on the North Island of New Zealand. Um, it has a river input into the embayment there. And there are energetic waves and currents uh, moving the sediment around. So we've got a river coming in. We've got energetic waves um, moving sediment. She had to get her wave input field, she had to nest it within a, a um, spatially variable wave field. So that, that was a bit complicated. She had to nest her open boundaries into a, a um, larger scale oceanographic model to get the along shelf currents. Um, so that was a bit added complication. She had to worry about cross shelf and um, depth stratification on the shelf, so she had to nest that within a large model. So it took her a while <laughs> to get this model up and running, um, a, a big effort. And, but once, she does, once you go through that effort, then you have this tool that gives you, hopefully, um, sediment fields that look like something in the real ocean. But it takes a big um, commitment to developing that model. But there's been. A lot of effort within, um, there's been some effort within systems to, to get some hydrodynamic models into the, into the repositories. And so I put this figure up here. This is the Chess ROMS model. It's a community ROMS model of um, the Chesapeake Bay. And so it's a three-dimensional hydrodynamic model. And um, within this, a variety of different modules can be loaded, um, a sediment transport model like we'll use today, but also models for biology and other, um, other components. And because there was a big call from the marine working group and the coastal working group to have a hydrodynamic model within systems, um, systems devoted quite a bit of time to putting chess ROMs into the repository. So, um, so it is available, but I think the general feeling is that even though a lot of effort went into putting this model and other Chesapeake Bay models in the repository, as well as putting a model that's a more general, not a Chesapeake Bay model, but a general ROMS model in the repository, that it hasn't really been used that much. So one thing I want us to think about when we come back for discussion is if there is a need for this kind of model, what can we do to capitalize on the invest investment that's already been made to, um, to, so that the resources would be used? The, the framework for the clinic today is we're going to, I'm going to overview the ROMS model framework and the IO structure of the model. And then we're going to look at an idealized continental shelf model that's called the River Plume 2 model in kind of ROMS jargon. And then as participants, you'll have a chance to look at model output. And um, as a group or as a, as a set of smaller groups, we'll, we'll um, make some changes to the idealized model and rerun it. And then um, you can look at the model output from the modified test case. And then after our coffee break, I'd like us to, to again, brainstorm for how to go forward with this type of thing. I took this slide from a talk from Hernan Arango. And this is um, Hernan's kind of uh, slide where he describes um, what's in ROMS, the Regional Ocean Modeling System. So Hernan is one of the main um, developers of the ROMS code. He's at Rutgers. And here he's showing maps of different ROMS um, model output from around the globe. And he has a list of, of the main features of the model. So in general, it's a free surface hydrostatic um, primitive equation model. And it uses terrain following vertical coordinates. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to show you guys more about the vertical and the horizontal grid because that, that is really relevant for, for um, how you analyze the model output. But, in here, he points out that ROMS has higher order numerical schemes. And it's um, parallelized, so it can be run in MPI. So it can be run in a high performance computing environment. Um, it has a, a lot of effort in ROMS has gone into data assimilation. So that's all that about tangent linear representer adjoint models. 
Um, so a big part of the ROMS community is interested in data assimilation. But the, community, the group I've worked with more is, is in this other bullet for tides, ecosystem, sediment, and sea ice models. Within the ROMS hydrodynamic model, there are um, ecosystem and sediment models that are linked to the hydrodynamics. And so one power, one thing that makes ROMS a nice environment to work within is that you can have a physical oceanographic model, but you can also have access to, um, to geochemical um, ecosystem and sediment transport models. These are slides I made. They don't have the pretty picture that Hernan had. But um, the, so the most relevant things, I think, for this group about ROMS is it's a 3D time-dependent hydrodynamic model that solves the basic conservation equations. It includes transport equations for temperature and salinity. And those transport equations can also be applied for um, sediment tracers as well as biogeochemical tracers. It's a community model. Um, right now, there are over 4,000 registered users. And then in addition to the hydrodynamics, there are modules, as I said, for sediment transport and biogeochemistry. So today, we'll use the sediment transport model. And that, the model we'll use is described in Warner et al. 2008. And it can account for bed load and suspended load. So we'll just use the suspended load today. Um, other things about ROMs that make it nice for coastal applications is it can be run as a nested model. So you can have higher resolution. Um, versions nested within the lower resolution. There are versions of it that can be run with wetting and drying. So you could, um, if you, you could set it up to do storm surge or, or run it in macrotidal environments. And there's a big data assimil assimilation community. A lot of effort, especially within the group that developed the sediment transport model, um, John Warner and his colleagues, a lot of effort has gone into coupling the model, the hydrodynamic model, with other models. So a lot of the effort has gone into coupling it with SWAN and with um, WARF. Yep. Um, there's a lot, a lot of the development effort in ROMS has been in developing the data assimilation parts of the code. That's what I meant. Oh, not for sediment. No. That's, that's a wide open niche. As far as I know, no one has applied the data assimilation to um, they've done it for um, temperature, salinity, currents, and, and the biogeochemists have done it to choose their um, parameters for their biological models. But as far as I know, the sediment community is not. So a lot of the data assimilation has been used to set open boundaries um, for physics or for the biological process. And so to continue our overview of ROMs, um, it's written in Fortran 90. It's, it's um, parallelized. So in theory, if you make changes to the code, you should be able to recompile and run it in parallel. Um, it includes a lot of options. So it includes different advection schemes that you can choose between. It includes um, a range of turbulence closures, and it includes a range of bottom boundary layer treatments. So on the one hand, that's really good. It gives the modeling community a lot of flexibility to choose which of these options that particular application needs. But on the other hand, I think that's one of the things that makes a learning curve for ROMs um, kind of steep, is that you, you have the sense that you've got to choose between all these things. And you, sometimes, if you just want an idealized continental shelf model, you might not want to have to think about these, you might just want to get a model where reasonable decisions were made for these um, different options. The model output is in, in NetCDF. And, um, the, but the model input is, a, is another place where the modeler has a lot of choice. And so there's a flexible mix of model input. If you have a long time series of model input, like if you have a wind field with um, time and spatial variation in the wind field, you'd want to put that in in a NetCDF file. But if you just wanted to run your model with a constant steady wind, then you, you don't want to generate a huge you know, five gigabyte wind field to just have a constant steady wind. So if you did that, you'd, you'd want to hardwire it in the code. That would be the easiest way to set a steady wind field. 
So ROMS gives you the flexibility to make that choice, to do it the way that you think is easiest. It might be some of the model input is typed into a text file. Some, and then some you have a choice between hardwiring it or putting it in that CDF. So again, you have the flexibility, but with that flexibility comes a bit of a learning curve because there have been times when we changed a model input, like we changed the text file, we changed a model input, and we look at the output and it didn't change. And then we have to sort through and figure out that, well, it wasn't getting the input from where we thought. It was getting it actually from hardwiring or from, from a net CDF file. So, so with the flexibility comes a, a kind of a layer of complexity that gives, makes the learning curve a little steeper. Okay, for the, for the grid, um, any hydrodynamic model, it's important that you think about what the grid is because that's one of the main differences between the different models that are out there. ROMS uses an orthogonal curvilinear grid, so it's a structured grid where the um, curvature of the grid can be chosen to kind of mimic the bathymetric curvature of the coastal area um, to the extent that you can still keep your grid cells pretty orthogonal. And it's a staggered grid, which most structured ocean most, most structured grid ocean models are staggered grids, but that, um, the fact that it's a staggered grid, for our, from our point of view, if we're not getting into the numerics, but we want to look at um, analyzing model output, we need to keep in mind what our horizontal grid is. So it uses an Arakawa C grid. So what that means is that the different model variables, the velocities and the tracer concentrations, are calculated at different locations in the grid. So on that figure on the right, each one of those squares represents a grid cell. And then in the middle of each square, there's a little green row. That's called the row point of the model grid. That's where the density is calculated, and the bed stress is calculated, and sediment concentration is calculated in the middle of the grid, grid cell. And then the velocity, the red U's, are the U points of the grid. That's where the cross, this might be the cross shelf velocities are calculated on the grid face, not in the grid center. Then the purple V's, or where the V velocities are calculated. So they're on the, maybe the, that would be the long shelf faces of the grid. So one thing I like about ROMS is in your output file, it tells you exactly where the U points, the row points, and the V points are. But what that means is that if you, what it means in terms of when you get a, a model output field, if you get a U field and a sediment concentration field, those, those, um, the sizes of those data arrays are going to be different because, because you have more U faces than you have middle of the grid cells because you have boundaries for each. So your U, you're going to have one extra velocity for each of your sediment concentrations. So your post-processing scripts just have to interpolate things to the same basis if you want to calculate something like a sediment flux. In terms of the vertical grid, um, since we're running sediment transport, then we have kind of two parts to our vertical grid. In here, this, this is a figure from John Warner's paper, and the blue grid cells represent the water column model. So that's the normal hydrodynamic model. The brown grid cells represent the sediment bed model. So in the, the model that we will run, we're going to have um, 13 water column grid cells, and they overlay 10 sediment bed layers. Okay. So here, the blue grid cells will have grid cell 1 up to n equals 13. And so we have 13 places where we're calcula calculating water velocities, u and v, and, and um, salinity, and suspended sediment concentrations in, in each of those 13 layers. In the sediment bed, we keep track of the sediment grain size distribution. And even though I don't know why John drew in U and V for our sediment bed layers, because that's a bit misleading. It's not going anywhere. It's, it's sediment bed. The only place it goes is through erosion and deposition. It exchanges with the overlying water. OK, so for each of our sediment bed layers, so here sediment bed layer 1 is the one that's at the sediment water interface. And we have, in the model we'll use today, we have 10 sediment bed layers. So N bed equals 10. And so within each of those sediment bed layers, the model keeps track of the amount of sediment for each grain size class that's in each of the bed layers. If you have erosion of, of one size class, that material would be removed from the surface layer and put up into suspended port in the, in the overlying layer. When you have deposition, the sediment settles out of the water column and goes into sediment bed layer one. No, 
know, it's so so. Um, Irene is asking about this variable bed ij. So ij is your horizontal location on the grid, and then the third index one two up to embed. That's your bed layer, and then this other index i thick. So this bed variable stores all the information about the sediment bed. So the i thick, the sediment bed thickness is the thickness of that bed layer, and it's tracked in kilograms per square meter, and it changes because our surface layer is going to get thicker or thinner depending on um, the active layer thickness of the bed. So that surface layer thickness is going to change. And then the way I like to run the model is to have this bottom layer be a really thick layer so that if I erode off a layer at the top, I can split off another layer at the bottom. Okay. So yeah, the thicknesses of the layers change with time. So in the model output, we'll have a bed, um, a model variable called bed thickness. That's a 3D variable in time. Because 3D, because we have X and Y locations, we have thickness in the bed, and then it changes with time because as the bed layers evolve. So it's 4, yeah, Julie's saying it's 4D because time is a variable, it's a D too. Okay? Now, the water column um, grid, this, I guess this isn't showing up very well, but this is, um, I want to point out that the ROMS vertical grid in the water column is a stretched grid. So that's what makes ROMS different from models like Princeton Ocean Model, is that it uses a, ROMS uses a stretched grid instead of a sigma grid. So in a model like, um, so in, in ROMS, the, the, the model is terrain following, meaning that the bottom grid cell always follows the bathymetry, okay? So we don't have a stair-stepping grid in the vertical. We have a terrain following grid in the vertical. And, but we keep the number of vertical grids constant. So in the model we'll do today, we're, we're going to have 13 water column grids. This, this figure here that I took from the ROMS wiki has 20 vertical grids. And so they're kind of gray lines showing where the, grid, the water grid cell interfaces are. So since you always have 20 grid cells, then in shallow water, your grid cells are going to be a lot thinner than in deep water, right? And so one issue with the sigma coordinate grid is um, for a model like Princeton Ocean Model, the percentage of the water column that the grid layer um, in includes is always a constant. So a grid layer might be 10% of the water column. So in a 10 meter deep layer, that grid, that grid cell is going to be one meter thick. In 100 meters of water depth, that grid cell is going to be 10 meters thick because it's going to scale with it. So that gives kind of um, a, a sigma coordinate model then has a hard time resolving high um, gradients near the bed when you get into deeper water. So what ROMS does differently is it uses a more complicated vertical um, grid so that it stretches out the, the grid cells in the deep water so that it always maintains a thin, or you can always maintain a thin layer above the bed, um, right at the bed sediment water interface, and a thin layer up at the water surface. So in this figure, if you can, I don't know if you can see the grid lines very well, but there's, um, there are thin layers following the bed so that you could resolve um, some of the concentration gradients in set suspended sediment in deep water, because your grid cells aren't getting huge in the deep water. And then you could also help to resolve some of the surface um, layer that's influenced by wind forcing, because you can maintain thin layers. So that's another choice that the modeler, when you set your grid up, you tell it how to stretch the grid. For some applications, you might not want to resolve high resolution near the bed, you might prefer to, prefer to have your resolution all at the water surface. Usually, since I do sediment transport, I want to keep resolution at the bed. So what are the implications for that? Is that, the, um, that you're, it's, it makes it a little bit more complicated to calculate your depths. If you want to plot a profile, then you need to get your Zs. So it makes it a little complicated to calculate that. And on top of the fact that the grid is changing with space, the grid changes in time because the sea surface elevation can go up and down. So if you have sea surface elevation going up from tides or something, then your whole grid has to expand to accommodate that. So your, bed, your delta Zs that are your, um, that are your layer thicknesses change with space, but they also change with time. And so ROMS doesn't put those Zs, those water layer thicknesses, into the output file. So instead, you have to run some kind of post-processing if you want to get those vertical um, depths. Okay, 
And then this, this is Hernan Arango's um, sediment transport figure, and I thought it was a lot prettier than um, anything I could have come up with today, so I included it. It has um, the transport equation for sediment in the, in the top, and then again that John Warner figure showing the, the um, sediment bed interface and the water column interface. And it points out some of the features of the sediment transport model. There's a, um, you, you tell it how many sediment tracers you want to include. So in, in the model input file, you tell it how many sediment um, size classes or sediment types you want to include. This is a little misleading because it says that you can define cohesive and non-cohesive sediment tracers. The cohesive version of the model is still more under development, and so um, the non-cohesive version of the model is the one that's obtained with the main trunk of ROMs. For each of those sediment tracers, it has a fixed grain size, um, sediment density, settling velocity, and critical shear stress for erosion. So it doesn't account for changes to, um, to either settling velocity or critical shear stress for erosion in, this, in the non-cohesive version of the model. But we, can tra we transfer sediment between the water column and the seabed through erosion and deposition. Um, I said before, we have a user-defined number of bed layers, so that stays constant in the model, um, and the, the example we'll use will have 10 bed layers. And for each of those bed layers, the model keeps track of the thickness of the bed layer, the sediment size class distribution, so what percentage of that bed layer is made up from each size class. Um, and it says it keeps track of the porosity and the age of the bed layer, but those are really just um, set as constant in the model. Okay, so now this is the case that we're going to look at and run today. This, is, this case is called River Plume 2. And there's been a version in the main trunk of ROM, so there's been a version of River Plume 2 for some time. But um, I used it for teaching the class that I teach at VIMS and, and to prepare for this clinic. And we had to make some changes to the main, the version that comes with the trunk in order for it to work. So I don't know if it was bit rot through the decade or what, but um, things changed, <laughs> and, um, but, but with um, Julia's help, we, and some of the students in the class also helped to figure out how to make the model run better. Okay, so the way, what the model is, it's River Plume 2, and it was originally based on a paper that um, Rich Signell wrote with Jason Hyatt, where they, they subjected an idealized continental shelf with a river plume coming out to a bunch of different advection schemes and looked at how well, how the river plume responded to different advection schemes. But, but this version of the model is pretty different, I think, than what Rich and um, Jason worked on back when they did it. So the way the model is set up is it's an idealized continental shelf, meaning it's just planar. The bathymetry is just straight lines. Um, the, the inshore boundary is 15 on the, on the shoreline, the water depth is 15 meters. On the offshore, um, the water depth is 100 meters. The cross-shelf extent is um, 50 kilometers, and we use 52 grid cells to give us those 50 kilometers across the shelf. And then the alongshore um, grid dimension is 100 kilometers. What, some of the things we added to River Plume 2 was we added waves, because the one that comes with the main trunk doesn't have waves, but since we do sediment transport, of course, we wanted to put waves in. So we added just a steady, um, uniform wave height of, of two meters with a wave period of 10 seconds. We had, um, and then there's a river discharge coming out, uh, 1,500 cubic meters per second freshwater discharge with two grams per liter of sediment coming out onto the shelf. And then the, the model is set up to have an along shelf current of five centimeters per second. So at the kind of, at the northern boundary, this along shelf current is imposed so that the so that um, that helps the the that's just and that kind of idealized along shelf current carrying both the fresh water and the sediment down the coast, and then I drew into this little cartoon I drew in a V showing that we get a velocity profile because even we we impose a mean five centimeter per second current but the model solves for three D velocity fields and then the C S is supposed to represent a suspended sediment concentration that the model is also accounting for. The wave direction is just straight in, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, this is a little bit more of the details of the model. Um, and, you know, I think, that I, 
One, I, one reason I went into so much detail is not because I think you'll remember all of this right here, but I think this PowerPoint will end up on the system's website, and if we, if we supply this kind of idealized test case, we're going to want this documentation for it. So here I outlined what I used for sediment types. We, we included three sediment types, and we put two of those in through the river, and then the third sediment type, the coarser one, we just put on the sediment bed. And to get the model looking, um, to, to kind of deal with some issues of the model behavior, we made that sediment bed stuff not be eroded. So the only sediment that's actively transported in the test case that we have today is the finer grain stuff that settles at 0.06 and about six millimeters per second. And let's see, the, um, I think I've covered a lot of this already. So the boundary conditions, we had to change the boundary conditions that came with the normal um, ROMs. And I think what's most relevant for, for thinking about what's going on in the model today is that the, the river flow and the along shelf current are both specified as boundary conditions. So they're both specified as kind of point sources of water um, with the river flow set up to give 1,500 cubic meters per second and the along shelf current set up to give five um, centimeters per second depth averaged currents. And we are using MP data for the tracers um, with the sediment Transporting sediment, we found that MP data is needed to have stability in the sediment field. The bottom boundary layer model is the um, wave current interaction of Madsen 94, and in ROM's language, it's coded as the SSW option, which um, stands for the, the um, guys at the USGS. Okay. So what I'm going to, to show you what different, what you can do with this type of model, I have examples from the class that I taught. So I have grad students take this class, and it's kind of a computer lab class. And each, each couple of weeks, we do a different idealized case. And what they do is they first look at the model run that Julia and I got to run, and then they make changes to the model run and write up a lab report on what they found. Okay? So I took figures from their work to show you examples of what, what kind of stuff you guys can plot with the River Plume 2 test case. So here, the top panel is the model grid that they used. So for this. This student used more grid cells than we're using. They used 100 grid cells in the cross shelf and 200 grid cells in the along shelf. So the one we're using is about a quarter of the size. And, and one reason we went to a smaller size is so it'll run more quickly. And the river mouth comes in um, at grid cell about, a, about 180 here. But in the model world run, it comes in at, at grid cell 61. And then the boundary conditions that we used in class were really different. But I, I really liked how this student, this student, by the way, got the highest grade in the class. And one reason was his lab reports were always so well organized. I liked how he provided the boundary conditions in his lab write up. Okay. So I'm going to show four examples of student work. The first two changed the river discharge. And then the third played with the advection scheme for the tracers. And the fourth changed the boundary conditions of the model. So the first example is from um, Britt Dean. She's a biology student at VIMS. And she wanted to, she had the idea that a lot of our rivers are in drought now. And so she wanted to run the model to see what it would be like in drought. So she cut the river discharge off. And so her, two, her figure on the top is a time snap from the two model runs, with the left panel being the normal discharge of 1,500 cubic meters per second, and the right-hand panel being reduced um, discharge. And so she's plotting with the color the salinity, and there are arrows in there that represent the velocity. And so the main difference is when she, you know, when she cut the river discharge down, her salinity plume got much thinner, and also I think the velocities in the plume changed. The next model experiment that was done was um, this student also changed river discharge, but they, they took the baseline case as their test case number two, and they halved and kind of doubled the river discharge, and then they analyzed um, how the plume area changed and the, how far from shore the plume extended. Okay, and so, so here, the, and then they provided two figures. The first figure is sea surface elevation, because when the plume comes out, that influences the um, density field on the shelf, and so you get changes to sea surface elevation. So here, they're showing the middle is the 1,500 cubic meters per second, and then the red is areas where the sea surface is elevated relative to mean, kind of mean sea level. So you see that as the freshwater discharge increased, the sea surface elevation in the plume increased. Okay, and then the arrows represent the um, currents. 
And then the next panel, the same model runs, and here they plotted the um, salinity versus the stream, the stream functions. And so you see that as the freshwater discharge increases, we get a bigger plume, but we also start to get a recirculation in the plume. That's why, so you have those, that kind of spiral showing that the, the plume is setting up a, a, an eddy. Okay. And then the third example, these students wanted to compare advection schemes. And so um, they had their model run with the, the left-hand panel is using a fourth order advection scheme and the right-hand panel is using the MP data. And I didn't, so I, I'm a little surprised at how, what their results were, but I, I didn't go back and double check their results. So here, you see as the, um, as a, as the model run goes on, it's, it's ticking away at time, that's day 20, day 22. Um, you see as it, as it goes on in time, the, mod, the MP data run gets unstable, which to me is opposite of how it's supposed to be. But. But so what they're plotting in their movie is the salinity field in color, and then they're using arrows to plot the velocity. Okay. And at the top, they have their timestamp. So now we're up to about day 75. Okay, so that's showing, suppose, so the two models are set up exactly the same. The only difference is the advection scheme that was used for salinity. And they also, they also set up, I like the, a lot of times we look in plan view, but it's a 3D model, so it's nice to look sometimes at a transect. So here they plotted a transect across the river mouth, and you know all the action is up where the freshwater plume is in the river mouth. And so what you see is that even, even we set up the model to have uniform discharge coming in at the river mouth, but an estuarine circulation sets up really quickly so that we have kind of the saltwater coming in under the fresh water that's going out. And that ended up making us trap a lot of our sediment in our little estuary once we put sediment transport in. And then the last model run, this student, um, Danielle Tarpley-Smith, changed the, the way that the boundary conditions were treated. And, it, and the, way that the, um, the way that we're gonna run the model is more like her test case where she, she changed the, the model, um, the way the, the free surface, um, the sea surface elevation was treated. So in the standard model that they ran, the um, eastern boundary was closed and the sea surface elevation was allowed to, to change. But in her test case, she clamped the, the sea surface elevation so that we wouldn't get um, kind of this large surge of water coming in. So here's a time series plot so the top panel shows her sea surface elevation. In the standard model, you see we got, she got about 10 centimeters of sediment added to the, or not sediment, but water added to the water column because of the way the open boundaries were acting. But when she clamped that to be, um, to be a small number, then, the test, then that case ran better. So the case that we're gonna run today, we used a clamped um, sea surface elevation instead of the one that had come in the, in the model. All right, so unless there are questions about that, then we're ready to give you guys some of the model output. Um, I'm gonna show you what some of the model output names are. And then we have um, this file, oceanhistcsdms3.nc. That's a model output file. And we can put them on your computers either using flash drives or you can download them from an FTP site, right? It's on the FTP site. Um, and then you can analyze the model. And after you do that for a little while, we can think about what we'd like to run differently in the model. Okay. And th this is a kind of a ideas of, of tools that you can use here today. We can use MATLAB for looking at the model output. Um, if you have access to Beach, you could run the code today. But if you wanna try some of this later on your own time, if you have access to Beach, you can run the code there. If you want, you could take the source code and recompile it to run on your own computer. Um, at our, in our lab, we tend to look to, to use um, some toolboxes, SNC tools and NC toolbox to analyze the model. People who are fans of Python have um, developed a toolkit called PyROMs. And then for more general kind of questions and information, the ROMs community um, kind of follows the, what the, the wiki and the forum at the ROMs website there. So in the next two panels, I say what's in the output file, okay? 
So I have it set up grid information, 2D variables, and 3D variables. So the grid information, you've got your horizontal grid points, the vertical grid points, the water depth, and the sediment bed grid. And then time is really, um, you know, time is also kind of grid, uh, the time grid. And so the panel on the, the columns on the left are kind of what in English you would call the variable. The column in the middle is what the output file calls the variable. So it calls the, the middle of the grid cells are called X row and Y row. And then the column on the right tells you the units. So X row and Y row are stored in meters. Um, the vertical grid Z isn't in the history file, so you need to run a MATLAB script to get those Z values. The water depth is called H. And so the water depth is kind of the bathymetry. That's the standard water depth. And then overlaying on that is the sea surface elevation that gives you total water depth. The sediment bed grid is in bed thickness, is the name of the var variable. And then the time is called ocean time, and that's in seconds. 2D variables that are stored are um, depth average velocity. So that's U bar and V bar. Okay. Then the total bed stress, I'm not quite sure who gave it this name, <laughs> but I call it Bavuster and Bavuster and usually leave off the CW max, but, um, but it, says, it stands for bed U or V component of the stress for the current and wave maximum value. Okay. So usually what I do is I read in Bavuster and Bavuster, and I square them and add them and take the square root to get something that I call tau B. And those are in Pascal's. The sea surface elevation is zeta in meters, so that's going to be the change to the overall water depth. And the wave orbital velocity is called u-bot and v-bot. And then the 3D variables that are in the history file that, I mean, there are, there are actually a lot more 3D variables. I just kind of wrote the ones that I tend to look at. The velocities are u, v, and w, and they're going to be at the u, v, and w points. So they're going to not be at the same location. They're not going to have the same size. So if you want to get total speed, which would be u squared plus v squared, the square root of it, Julia wrote a, an M file that interpolates everything to the row point so you can get the total speed. The tracer concentrations are salt and temperature, and they're, they are calculated in the middle of the grid cells. The sediment concentrations, in their units are kilograms per cubic meter, and they're um, called MUDO1, MUDO2, MUDO3, which is another example of a I would say a poor choice of name because it makes you think that you're running a cohesive model, right? But, but you're not. It's a non-cohesive model, um, and, but the variable names are MUDO1, MUDO2, and MUDO3. The bed sediment, you can get the thickness of the layers in, is, is in bed thickness, but a lot of times I look at the, the, the fraction, the amount of each sediment type in each bed layer is stored in mud mass 01, mud mass 02, and mud mass 03. So these, the one, two, and three are because we have three grain classes. If you had seven grain classes, you'd have mud mass 01 all the way up to mud mass 07. Okay. So if you want to get, so that's going to, the bed sediment is going to be the amount of each sediment class in terms of kilograms per square meter for each bed layer. So if you want to get the total amount of size class one on the bed, you can just sum it. You sum up all the kilograms per square meter for all of your 10 layers, and that gives you the kilograms per square meter of that size class on the bed. Okay? Are there questions about that, or you might have questions once you get into it? Okay, so now we're going to give you the output file, and you can play around with making some figures, um, maybe for 20 minutes, and then think about what kind of different, what you would like to change in the model to, to try and start another model run that can run, that we can get running before the coffee break. All right, so if you want to work in MATLAB, but you don't have MATLAB, can you, you want to go find a buddy? And if you, if you have, maybe raise your hand if you have, to get the, do I need to go, what, the next slide says where you can get the data. So you can get both the model output and M files that will help you analyze the model output. We have it on thumb drives, or you can get it, try and get it from the FTP site. Okay? So maybe raise your hand if you would like Tara or Julia or me to help you get the data on, uh, from the thumb drive. All right, Chris. <laughs> I think that might be the quickest, easiest approach. Okay. 
guys, can you guys, I'm going to get a drink of water. And the little delicate one.
about what kind of model runs we might like to do. And then while we have coffee and um, the models can run, and then after the break we can check in and then analyze the revised model. Okay? So
directions on how to run it later. Um, I have them. You also all have them in the files you downloaded. So were they on the thumb drive files too? I read what you know what. Well, we collect it rolling, so we'll figure we're going to edit, you know, edit at the dead spots as far as what you're talking about. So you're done then? Okay. All right. Well, yes. I'll, I'll keep an eye. If you're going to talk at all, maybe like give yeah. me a signal. Okay. Say like something like that.